Sound good. There are extra handouts on the table over there. Okay. All right, has anybody ever seen a manometer before? No. That's good. <laughs> By the way, doing your trick. My name is Nathan Henry, and I'd like to start. I like to start these things out with a little laugh. So uh, let's try this one on. Light travels faster than sound. That is why some people appear bright until you hear them speak. <laughs> <laughs> Remember that next time you're watching C-SPAN. The purpose of this class is to introduce the class to the diverse world of manometers and to briefly describe their operation with a focus on understanding. So. Starting in the upper left, down to the upper right, you see all kinds of incline manometers. This is a slack tube manometer. It's like a U-tube manometer that you can roll up. By the way, you can fabricate a U-tube manometer simply with a piece of Tigon and a scale. That's all you need, and it'll be as accurate as the scale that you're using in your calibrated eye. This manometer that I've constructed, I thought about getting a hand pump in here. But I figured that using a cup of water would be easier. So if you just stick the tube down in a cup of water, you can see a deflection and see how it works. How many people in this room think that manometers are simple devices? Wow, nobody? Wonder cruisers. They are simple devices. They're simple, they're inherently accurate, and they're easy to read and troubleshoot. Uh, to touch on fluids, you see that these three have red fluid in them. That would be a red oil. You can see on this one the density of the red oil is 0.87. That's not what we use. We use 0.826. But then again, this one's made in France. So, <laughs> Also, if you notice how uh, this one works exactly opposite of the manometers that we use, like this one, on this incline manometer, we pump from the top down. We deflect the fluid down. On this one, they're pumping into the bottom. There's their zero line. They're deflecting the fluid up. And the scale is in millimeters of water. So just a little stuff to get, uh, get your mind rolling on manometers and uh, to drive home the fact that water seeks its own level, I've added a water level here, just a simple piece of Tigon with water in it. Whenever you put the water level on one point and have someone hold the water level on the other point, those two points are level. Um, Mr. Cote told me that's how he hung a suspended ceiling once, and it was perfectly flat, just putting a water level on one point and marking points all the way around the room. And whenever he did his tie wires, he just held it out there and everything was perfectly flat when he got done. This right here is called a ring manometer. It's actually got an indicator on it. It's the only manometer I've ever seen that has a scale and an indicator. And then, once again, the simple YouTube manometer. Water seeks its own level. Everyone has seen one of these before, I should hope. Everyone knows that as long as these two points are tied and these two points are tied, that this is an accurate <coughs> representation of level in the tank. That's the same way a water level works, except instead of having the two points tied with the process, you've got the two points tied together with atmospheric pressure. There's no difference. Meniscus. I put notes on there for you. Mercury typically seeks a convex meniscus because it does not wet the sides of the tube. Oil and water having a specific gravity of 0.826 and 1.0 respectively, they do wet the sides of the tube so you will get a concave meniscus. This is uh, something that I found on the internet and I thought it was a 
pretty interesting. So I figured I would share it with you because it does it does uh, deal with what we're talking about. This is more like a balance manometer. If you've ever worked on a motorcycle before and you wanted you had more than one carburetor and you wanted to get the vacuum on all the carburetors to the same level, you would hook these two tubes, one to each carburetor, fire it off, and see which one had more pressure and balance them accordingly. The advantage to this is, is that if one side is drawing too much vacuum and it sucks all the water into the other vessel, it will only fill up so far and then it will allow air to bubble through rather than sucking water into the carburetor. So that's the reason for the two glasses and the little dip tube there. And you can leave that running, you know, until you get the carburetor adjusted and it sucks the water back into the other uh, glass and they equal out whenever they're equaled out. Carburetor's balance. Thought that was pretty slick. This is your YouTube manometer, and <coughs> excuse me, I'm, I'm having a little trouble with allergies, so <coughs> pardon the grunting and coughing. But in a YouTube manometer, this is the exaggerated drawing, but your zero line is where you want to start out, and where you read your meniscus at the zero line, it doesn't really matter. Read the meniscus wherever you feel comfortable. For example, if you prefer reading it at the, the apex of the meniscus or at the edges, whichever one, just be sure that you always take your reading from that point. Always be consistent and you'll be 100% accurate. Start out with your water levels at zero, with the YouTube hanging perfectly vertical like this one. And whenever you pressurize one side or draw a vacuum on the other, you read the difference in water level. So if your scale is scaled in inches, it'll actually be twice the deflection. <coughs> We're deflected to two inches. We have four inches of total water level, water inches of water DP. And once again, here's your slack tube manometer. A manometer, you can fill up with anything. You can put water in it, you can put red oil in it, but you have to take into account the specific gravity change. You could even put mercury in it. Not here, but anywhere else. If you put mercury in it, you would be reading inches of mercury. Just be sure that you always account for specific gravity. Here is the red oil manometer. I'll pass this around to you. There are several things you need to note on this red oil manometer. Clean with soap and water or kerosene only. Use Dwyer 0.826 specific gravity red oil only. And here is a little vial of 0.826 red oil that you can pass around and take a look at. Um, you notice that this is scaled in inches of water. If you were to hold a ruler up to this vertical scale over here, like if you lined up the zero inch mark with two and tried to read an inch down, you, you'd end up just shy of the three line. And the reason for that is because this is 0.826 specific gravity read in inches of water. This stuff will deflect more than a physical inch to indicate an inch of water. This is also calibrated to compensate for the volumetric displacement into this chamber right here. You notice that this chamber is significantly bigger in diameter than the tube that's running through this. This, just like any YouTube manometer, you read the difference in the two water levels. But Dwyer, being the intelligent folks that they are, they compensated for all of that with this simple to read scale, scale in inches of water. There's also this other scale that is in red, velocity, feet per minute, air at 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Remember that, I'll touch on that here in a minute. But uh, the other things you need to notice on this are the level, <coughs> And this is what you use to level it. This screw right here, when you turn this foot sideways and set it down, you're looking straight down on that ball and you can level it.
There's also a sticker right above the level adjustment that has these words written on it. This thing can hold a static pressure of 100 PSI. Would I ever do it? No. <laughs> this is the picture of the meniscus set at zero. I personally like to read the meniscus where it comes to a point. So I put that point on the very left side of the zero line. And wherever I take my reading, I take it right on the front of that meniscus. And that is accurate in the realm of manometers. Here's a close-up of the display for the 826 specific gravity and the, the level ball like no one's ever seen that before. Here is your uh, pito tube. This manometer being scaled in uh, velocity feet per minute here at 70 degrees Fahrenheit has a pitot tube that comes with it. And I've drawn one right here. When I pass this around, you can see that there are like a perforation of holes around here. That is for static pressure reading. If you're sticking this into an air duct and you have flow going this way, these little dots, they will read the static pressure inside of the duct and they will give that static pressure reading to your low pressure side of your manometer. The high pressure side is tubed into this hole on the front, which is the dynamic port. That is catching the velocity of the air hitting the front of it. And then it reads out, I've drawn this one to feet per minute times 100, so five to four, or five, 500 to 4,000 feet per minute. And then I've drawn the three types of pitot tubes over here on, on the right. You've got your pitot-static tube, which is what I just described to you, with the little holes around the, around the uh, barrel and the hole in the front. You've got a static source pitot tube, which has no hole in the front. It is only meant for reading the static pressure inside the duct. And then you have a simple pitot tube, which is just the hole on the front. Has anyone ever seen a pitot tube before? Has anyone ever seen a pitot tube somewhere else that they'd like to share? Very good. On the front of airplanes. Aircraft. Mm -hmm. Yep. They measure airspeed for aircraft. And this shows one <coughs> tubed up to this manometer here. You notice that the high side coming out of the very bottom is tubed up to the high side. The low side is connected to this uh, static pressure port. One other thing you'll want to note, whenever you look at the side of this pitot tube, there is a scale in inches on the side of it. So that when you have <coughs> it in a duct and you're measuring air velocity inside of the duct, you can tell how many inches you are inside of that duct. And where I come from, back in the nuclear industry, we had to measure mass flows in ducts all the time. And the way we did that, see, this is scaled in feet per minute, not mass flow. So what you had to do is you had to take several measurements across the duct, plug them into a handy calculation that would spit out the mass flow. So I'll go ahead and start passing these around. Your micro manometer Boy, did I have a misconception about this thing when I was trying to calibrate that, what was it, Ryan, like a quarter inch of water transmitter that we had. I was using it completely 180 degrees out of true. So let me describe to you how to use this thing the correct way so that there's no more confusion. This is the high pressure port. This is the low pressure port. Oh, by the way, the high and low pressure ports, they have an O-ring in them and these are shut. So you can turn it upside down if you drop it or whatever. It won't spill anything. And when you open those ports, you zero out your water level, you zero out your scale. I had all that down. But when you go to pump this thing up, what you need to do is what may be referred to as a reverse cowl. For instance, if you're pumping up a transmitter, you have to go to 0.1 inches of water. Go to 0.1 inches of water on your transmitter. Then 
tweak this vernier until you get the deflection on the needle. That is your reading. You take your reading off the vernier. The way I was doing it that was completely wrong is I was trying to set the gap and then pump the pressure up until it tripped. Not accurate at all. So once again on these things you have to look at the level. This is a uh, three-legged dog. You see one leg back here and then two adjustable legs up front. You have a level bead right there on the front. So whenever you get this thing level and turn it on, it should be accurate. This one I tried to put a battery into yesterday and it did not work, so there'll be no deflection. Um, Shop 7 has borrowed the other manometer that looks like this that actually does work. So you can start passing that around. But the way you zero the scale, you see there's a, a water level that's prescribed here. It's, it's a suggestion for a better, like a better term. But as long as you have it close to that level, you're all right. The way you zero this needle is you loosen this knurled knob and you screw the needle either in or out until you get your zero. Whenever you zero, you trip. So once you set the zero, then you tighten that knurled knob down. If this is indicating zero, you check it. As long as it's indicating zero, you're all right. Then pump away. Here's a close-up of the vernier, gate, the vernier uh, adjustment. The vernier is scaled to one inch. Now, if you think about it, this closely represents a YouTube manometer like that one. What do we know about YouTube manometers? You pump one side down, the other side comes up, you take the difference, the total difference. So using that scale to one inch is a bit of a misnomer. You have to take this scale and divide by two because you're not only deflecting up whatever fraction of an inch, but you're also deflecting down over here. So take this scale, divide by two, and you'll be just fine. This will not be on the test. <coughs> so everybody take a sigh of relief. The ring balance manometer. Can anybody figure out why I put this into this presentation? It kind of keys off the last presentation that I did, which was on force balance mechanisms. This is a force balance instrument. You have a ring that is filled with water, kind of like a YouTube manometer. You have a fulcrum <coughs> and an indicator. The balance comes from the weight. So whenever you deflect this high pressure side down, the weight comes up until the system balances. So it is a force balance instrument. Oops. And now this is the scary part. There is a pneumatic ring balance in the, in, in ring balance manometer. Now, I can pretty much reason my way through the way this thing works, but the one thing that I cannot find on this drawing is a feedback mechanism. Remember how on the 11 GM Foxborough pneumatic transmitter we had the feedback bellows that was acting in opposition to the force being applied? There is no feedback on this. So this is kind of what I like to think of as a pneumatic board-on tube gauge. If you think about a board-on tube gauge, there's no feedback in that. You've just got the flexure of the board-on tube acting on the indication and that's it. There's no feedback. It's the same with this. Except this ring, unlike the last one, doesn't move very much. This one is able to move. <coughs> this one only moves just a little bitty bit for the reason that it's got links and levers that go to a pilot valve that is supporting air to the output. But see if there was a feedback element it would be attached to this pneumatic output line somewhere and it is not. <coughs> now can anybody name any manometers that they may have seen outside of work 
that they may not have realized was a manometer? You've probably seen them all your life. Pat, any idea? No, not yet. Hint, they live in hospitals. Blood pressure cuffs. Very good. That is called a sphygmo manometer or a blood manometer. It is scaled in millimeters of mercury. This one is a mercury free manometer. Can anybody guess how that works? <laughs> it's an LCD, I tricked you. It's electronic. <laughs> So, manometers are all around you. Can't get away from them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nathan. Mm -hmm. Anybody have any questions? Mm -hmm. Stop